Hello and welcome to Modern Renaissance, a cross-category sale which will be taking place here at Sotheby's London on the 25th of March. It's a sale dominated by artists who radically reinvented painting and sculpture over the last 500 years. Artists of different times and places who, when brought together as they are here, have much more in common than we might think. Now I'm going to take you on a tour of the highlights of the sale and I'll be meeting some of Sotheby's specialists along the way. One of the first things you see when you enter the sale is this bewitching picture made at the crucible of the Italian Renaissance in 15th century Florence. And thank you, Alex Bell, for joining me. It is. Nice to see you. This is a ravishing painting, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. No, it's fantastic. It is, it is quintessentially quattrocento, it seems to me. Yeah. I mean, it's painted about 550 years ago in Florence. And I mean, what, what I think is fascinating about this picture is you know, we look at a portrait the idea is very familiar to us today, a person looking out at us. But you have to remember when this was painted, this idea was radically new. Portraits as an independent genre were, were something that was, were proliferating, and Florence was really a hub of where this new art form was taking hold. And this is a, an extraordinary example, incredibly rare. It's known as Portrait of a Youth. I presume we know nothing about the sitter. We don't know who he is. We can obviously tell that he's of high social standing. He's wearing this extremely expensive, wonderful, elaborate costume with um, a very beautiful doublet with brocade, red brocade, and this wonderful velvet tabard uh, set against this lovely blue sky. Yeah, he must be, what, I guess, early teens, 13, 14 years old. The, the details are just exquisite here, aren't they? He's painted every absolutely well this is very much uh, this is very much something that the Polaiola brothers did i mean uh, they designed tapestry and, and, and costume designs and so on um and that they, they are as you say defining every single feature of this picture from the eyelashes to the hair to the details of the brocade and so on they were one of the leading workshops in france at the time absolute innovators coming up with all these new ideas working for the florentine elite um, and the portrait form was something that was particularly their thing. Um, they're known, I think, principally for the profile portraits mm. of uh, Florentine ladies, which you can see in a number of museums throughout Europe. But this is particularly interesting because it's, it's a full frontal picture. Mm. There's nothing about it which gets in the way of seeing this young man looking out at you. It's, it's a real very, encounter, isn't it's it? It's incredibly direct, isn't it? And you look at it now and you feel that you could have been there. It's a kind of selfie from 550 <laughs> years ago. I mean, how unusual is it for something like this to come to the market nowadays? Well, I can't think of one like this that has in my time. And in fact, we're not aware of another portrait by the artist in private hands. They're that right. rare. They really are. Well, we, we, we talk about rarities, but, but at the same time, in January, another 15th century Italian portrait came on the market by Botticelli. It did. It sold for $92 million exactly. or something like that. They are in some ways companion pieces, aren't they? Well, not only were they painted in Florence about less than 10 years apart, but the picture sold in New York belonged to the same owner who owned this picture in the middle of the last right. century. An absolutely fascinating man. Thomas Merton was a scientist, a physicist. He was the first scientist employed by the Secret Service during right. the First World War. <laughs> he came up with lots of interesting uh, uh, techniques and, and, and devices which were useful in the war effort. But he was, you know, I think drawn to this picture um, because of its technique, because of its colour. He was a spectroscopist, as I said. And uh, was also served on the scientific board of the National Gallery towards the end of his life. So absolutely, uh, I can see why this appealed to him. I mean, we're very lucky to be custodians of it for a short while well, now. What an exquisite object. Thank you so much for sharing Thank your you. expertise, Alex. Thank you. Now, turning from a portrait by an old master to a portrait by a modern master, perhaps the greatest modern master of them all, Pablo Picasso, Helena Newman. It's quite interesting to, to move from this picture to that one, because in some ways, this Picasso, modern as it looks, is quite a traditional format for a picture. Well, he's used his tried and tested and much-loved format of a seated woman in an armchair. It's one of a group of portraits from the early 40s, uh, painted by Picasso, in Paris um, of his muse and lover, the surrealist photographer Dora Maar. And she's often depicted enclosed in quite an upright, very distinctive armchair, as seen here, um, quite cropped in the composition, very intense. I mean, she was a very, very different woman from Marie-Thérèse, who was uh, um, uh, the muse and model of the early 30s. 
she's the one who is often depicted in somnolent and um, very lyrical mm. poses. Dora Maar, there's much, much more intensity. And, you know, as always the case with Picasso, his portraits of women are also kind of self-portraits yeah. because there's so much kind of of himself that he puts in to his model. There's a wonderful story about when Picasso first met Dora Maar. She was at a restaurant, she had her hand in a glove on yeah. a table and she was using this pen knife to stab between her fingers and yeah. every so often she missed the glove filled with, I, with, with blood yes. and Picasso kept it as a keepsake. Yeah. But that spikiness runs through all of his pictures of her, doesn't yes. it? Yes, I mean, she is the, the weeping woman, uh, as we know here in London from the great picture of the Tate. Uh, she's the one with this sort of incredible emotional intensity and mm. Picasso was very seduced by, uh, by her personality. She was a very striking woman, incredible jet black hair, very intense, highly intellectual, very creative. And I think, you know, she brought something to Picasso also in those war years that mm. was, was particularly, you know, in tune with his mood, in tune with the times. Uh, you know, they, they were together, kind of locked down in a way in Paris, <laughs> weren't they? You know, this yeah. was 1941, it was in the depths of the occupation. It somehow reflected in the palette, which is quite austere, quite dark. Mm and in the composition, which harkens back to the sort of intensity of Cubism. And yes, and there was this very intense sort of symbiotic relationship and Dora Maar was at the center of that. Can you put this painting into some kind of stylistic context in terms of Picasso's career? Yes, well, I mean, if you think of the decades of Picasso's career, they very often define, you know, you think of the Cubism of the teens and then, you, and then the classical period of the 20s and then moving in, as I said, to Marie-Thérèse when you get these very voluptuous curves. Mm. And then in this period in the early 40s, they're very much hearkening back to what was going on in the yeah. Cubists. But it's also making a shift that will herald what comes with the 50s François Gillot and then the great monumental paintings of the 60s. Well, what a treat to look at yeah. it. Thank you very much, Helen. Well, let's now turn to another totemic artist of the modern period, one who worked not in France, but in Norway. He is, of course, Edvard Munch. And we're lucky here to not just have one great Munch, but two. Thomas, let's start with this self-portrait. Munch was a very prolific self-portraitist, wasn't he? He was. I mean, it was the subject that probably fascinated him more than anything else, um, his own self-image. He painted himself from right at the very beginning of his career, right until the very final years. And throughout, um, you see both the change in his style, but also his uh, mental state and how he perceived himself as much as the world outside came to perceive him. Um, and in a painting like this, you have him absolutely proclaim himself as an artist. He is mm -hmm. Munch as painter. So many of his portraits are quite neurotic, even quite dark. This one is very different. It really exudes a sense of confidence, doesn't it? It does. I mean, painted in 1926, it's a, it's a painting where he has uh, achieved you know, full recognition as an artist, not just from um, you know, his fellow countrymen, but also has great success in Europe, particularly in Germany, and latterly in France as well. And he's bought himself this country state of Eccoli, much like Monet of Giverny. It becomes the sort of locus of all of his thoughts and artistic ideas. And he paints himself also in bright sunshine. And he's mm. an artist, we must remember, <laughs> he's Norwegian. Um, and so he's, he's used to uh, you know, grabbing the sun um, at every opportunity and so he stands here you know, in the full glare of the sun. I presume that this is Eccles' studio in the background, is that yes, correct? Yes, that is, yeah. And it's somewhere that he, he, he played um, uh, a lot as, a, as an artist with all of the different themes and, and ideas that had captivated him. But it's also the setting for a period of sustained happiness. Mm. Um, after um, his great crises of 1908, he gains confidence in his own work, gains confidence in his powers of expression and the scale of his works continues to kind of increase and, and embolden him. And I think perhaps it's very telling that this is a self-portrait. It's quite rare to see self-portraits at this stage outside of the mm. studio. He doesn't exhibit them, um, but it is um, exhibited first at Mannheim, which, um, at the Kunstcenter in Mannheim, which eventually acquires it. Well, then there's a very interesting provenance from that point for up to the 19th, through the 1930s and 40s. Can you tell me a little bit more about what happened in that period to the picture? 
Well, um, the, as the Nazi Party came to power, they were very keen to um, propagate their own idea of what art um, and ideals should, and cultural ideas should be. Um, and they deemed certain artists, and Munch was one of them, as degenerate, mm -hmm. um, not fit for public consumption, although they hilariously did have probably one of the most successful exhibitions um, on that <laughs> name in Munich. Um, and uh, Munch, like most of um, the avant-garde artists that were de termed degenerate, um, found all of their music, all their pictures being removed from museums, actually you know, voluntarily deaccessioned by the museums mm -hmm. that owned them. This picture uh, ends up in the hands of uh, a dealer, a Norwegian dealer called Halverson, who mm. sets out to essentially save Munch's art from <laughs> the deaccessioning programs in Germany. And with Thomas Olsen um, as backer, manages to bring most of these pictures back to Norway, where um, paintings like this, or indeed the next picture we're about to see now, um, uh, were reintegrated either into the national collections or Munk himself reacquired them or great patrons like Olsen built their own collections. Thomas, let's now turn to this other picture, which is a very different kind of painting, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's, it's painted on an enormous scale um, and it's a painting that Munk has poured all of his various ideas and themes, those that bubbled along and, and became irrepressible by this point. Um, in 1904. It's intellectually and thematically very ambitious, isn't it? It is, and it's a painting that it, it epitomises what he's trying to cope with in 1904, which mm. is um, a period of, of growing international reputation, mm. um, artistic freedom afforded by great patronage by this point, especially in Germany, but also personal crises. He has an alcohol problem, um, and um, which is in total contrast to the uh, commission that he was given by his friend and patron, Dr. Max Linder, um, who asked for a series of paintings that could adorn um, his children's nursery. Um, Munk rose to this task, um, <laughs> probably with a slightly more adult sense of fun, filling his pictures with um, courting couples and embracing um, figures, as well as um, the slight uncertainties and anxieties caused by perhaps you know, a group of nervously sort of chattering schoolgirls whispering about the painter behind their closed hands. I've got to say, if I had to find an artist to paint my son's room, I probably wouldn't go for Munch. Not because he's not a great artist, he's a great artist, but because he's a very adult and often quite melancholy artist. How did the commission go down? Sadly for Munch, although probably in retrospect um, rather better for us, Linda was a little horrified um, <laughs> by what he had created, which was essentially a series celebrating life, but the very difficult themes of, of um, love and jealousy, anxiety, all these key central themes to Munch, but that's what Munch felt was important mm. to express. Linda, though his great patron and great supporter, had commissioned him, um, sadly, in 1904, later, uh, after receiving the pictures, returned them to Munch in his studio. One of the most interesting parts of this picture is this area, this motif. Some years later, after finishing the picture, Munch somehow got it back and added these figures. Why do you think he did that, and, and what do they mean? Well, that's the fascinating thing about this picture, is that we know the underlying composition was that of the Linda Fries um, for the child's nursery, where we've got these rather sort of sunny um, motifs like the boat and the canoe and you know, the girls. Um, in conference, but these two haunting figures, these mm. spectral um, motifs at the very, very front of the composition um, were added at a later time, presumably, um, we know certainly by 1911, but presumably before the final moment of crisis um, in 1908 when he has a real breakdown mm. and is actually um, taken to a sanatorium to recover. And it's this haunting, um, beseeching quality of the female mm -hmm. figure that we have on the right, um, wrapped in embrace, the man turned, his back turned to us, so he's very much in support of her, but she reaches out to the viewer. Mm -hmm. Whether or not this is a personal reference, a biographical reference um, to an earlier failed relationship um, for Munch, or one of his extraordinarily universal expressions of the human mm -hmm. condition, it's for us to speculate and enjoy. Such a mysterious painting. Thank you very much, Thomas. Well, one of the great influences on Munch was Vincent van Gogh, and we're now going to cross the channel to look at an important work by that artist with Aurelie van der Voort, who will be the auctioneer of the Impressionist and Modern Art Sale taking place in Paris on the 25th of March. 
Thank you, and welcome to the Paris Galleries now. I would like to start our Paris tour with this exceptional painting by Vincent Van Gogh, Seine de Rue à Montmartre. It is one of the highlights of the Paris auction, and it will be sold in association with the Parisian auction house Mirabeau Mercier. This work was painted when Vincent Van Gogh was living in Paris, in Montmartre, Rue Le Pic, with his brother Théo, in 1887. This was a crucial period for Vincent Van Gogh because at this moment he met other artists from the Parisian avant-garde, such as Signac, Émile Bernard, or Toulouse-Lautrec, and this had a great influence on his art. For instance, he introduced light and color in his art, as you can see in the present painting. In this work, Vincent van Gogh depicted one of the most famous places in Paris, the Montmartre windmill, uh, also called Moulin de la Galette. Uh, and it was one of the favorite subjects of Vincent van Gogh when he was living in Paris, probably echoing his childhood in the Netherlands. Here, you can see one of the smaller mills of the Moulin de la Galette, the paper mill. And it is very interesting to have this work today because this mill was destroyed in 1911, so it's very moving to see it in this painting. Uh, it's really a great privilege for Sotheby's to present this work at auction today uh, because it has remained in the same French families for one century and it is the very first time it is presented at auction. Uh, so we are very proud to show it to the public now. Vincent van Gogh had a huge influence on later artists and one of his greatest living fans is David Hockney. And we're very lucky in this sale to have a major work by Hockney that actively engages with the history of Dutch art. Alex Branchik, where does this picture fit into Hockney's career? Tall Dutch Trees after Hobbema, useful knowledge from 2017, was the centerpiece of one of David Hockney's later exhibitions exhibited at Pace Gallery in New York in 2018. Arguably, it's the most famous of, of the group of works which look back at his earlier period of painting um, and famously was uh, illustrated on the front cover of The New Yorker that month. It's a painting that is inspired by another painting, as the title suggests. Can you tell me a little bit more about the picture that inspired it and what Hockney is doing in relation to that picture? The painting is called, is, is titled after Hobbema, referring to Meindert Hobbema's Dutch Golden Age masterpiece in the National Gallery here in London. And it's a painting which struck the young 18-year-old David Hockney when he first came to London as a precocious Bradford Art School student way back then. And I think what's fascinating here is that you've got an artist in his 80th year, 62 years later, but still fascinated by this single image which captured him as a, as a young art student. And I think what it was in particular that grabbed him about the Hobbema is this, this dual perspective that he identified. So on the one hand, you've got the traditional vanishing point on the horizon line at the end of the road, these tall trees leading your eyes towards this vanishing point. But at the same time, he not identifies another one of this rush upwards because of these alder trees. So you're always looking up at the sky. And I think to have an artist in his 80th year, but still so radical in the way that he's shaped the canvas like this, just demonstrates what an incredible painter he is and how important he is for, for future generations of artists. Exactly. It's a picture that, that replicates many of the features of the Hobbema, although there are some, some significant differences. One, I think, is the, is the use of colour. This is filled with extremely shrill, synthetic acrylic paint, isn't it? It feels very much like a Hockney. I think that's it. I mean, for me, this is much more Sunset Boulevard than it is the <laughs> Avenue in Middle Harness. It's, it's got this very heightened California colour, which I think is... Is, is true of all the paintings in that show at the Pace Gallery, which look back at his earlier works of Yorkshire landscapes, etc., but always with this heightened colour key, this incredible cerulean blue and this coral mm. colours. Um, and it's much more schematic as well, that you know, these, these, these gardens in the foreground are sort of reduced into much more schematic forms. The rooftops become almost like pyramids. But nonetheless, it is undeniably and quintessentially based on that Hobbema painting. One of the most distinctive things about this painting is the fact that Hockney has chopped it up or presented it as several different strangely shaped canvases, one of them. Why did he do that? And, and what do you think the effect is? He is an incredibly experimental artist and has been throughout his career. I think what he's doing here is really analyzing perspective and particularly single point perspective. Rather than just standing here in a single spot looking at a painting of a landscape, what he's doing is actually ripped out the center foreground mm. So this, the, the road which leads you towards the horizon has gone, and it actually puts us in the picture frame, and actually the vanishing point itself actually vanishes, 
and all the attention comes to everything around us, this peripheral vision that we see. And it's much more like we're moving in time. This is like sitting in a car driving down the road between, between these alder trees. It is a thrilling work. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Let's now zoom back in time to post-Second World War Paris, when art was being reimagined yet again. That important period in the history of art is very well represented in this sale. There are works by Jean Fautrier, by Vols, but perhaps the most important figure in this very important period was Jean de Buffet. Emma Baker, what makes de Buffet such an important artist? He was a real original. He has been incredibly influential for artists, contemporary artists, artists in the later 20th century, for David Hockney, for example, mm. especially in the 1960s, um, and also Jean-Michel Basquiat. These mm. artists have taken a lot from de Buffet. And like I said, he was an original. He really broke the rules. He broke down conventions of what it is to be a painter after the Second World War. Now, this work comes from a decisive early period in his mm -hmm. career. Can you tell me a little bit more about the circumstances of that? Sure. Um, he came to art pretty late in life. He was 41 when he started to make work as, a, as an artist. And this particular painting was included in de Buffet's second only solo show. Mm. It was at Gallery René Drouin. Uh, it was in 1946. Um, and it was only a matter of months, really, until, you know, after the Second World War ended in September 45, that this work was created and exhibited. And it caused a real stir. It was controversial. I think the way that he paints very sort of materials that he's using, very kind of cheap materials mixed in with oil paint. He's using sand and gravel and shards of glass that you can see mm. in this work. And it's very sort of breaking with tradition. It was very controversial. The critics didn't like it, but the general public loved it. <laughs> and this show, really, it sold out within a few days. What are we looking at? What is the subject matter here? So we've got two people. They're in an embrace. They're dancing. Um, and it really is a painting full of joy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that really does kind of juxtapose against the way that he paints, which is very brutal. It's very sort of... It's very kind of violent, the way that he uses paint and texture. But at the same time, this picture is full of hopefulness after the Second World War. Like I said, it was created in February 1946, a matter of months after the end of the Second World War. So it's full of hope for a new sort of life and getting back to normal and doing things that make you happy, like dancing, going out for, <laughs> for fun and, and leisure activities. We all feel like that now, We do, we? we do. We know how that feels right now because of the pandemic. So, you know, we can really relate to what, what de Buffet is trying to convey in this painting. You've talked about this extremely unconventional violent technique. What do you think he was trying to achieve with that? What was he trying to say? I think he was trying to just break away from everything that had come before. So the way that figurative painting had been treated by artists, the way that we look, he wanted to break it down and insert something of our reality and authenticity, the authenticity of our reality, the gritty reality, coming after the destruction of the Second World War, you see that in de Buffet's application and the medium that he's using. So he really is kind of responding to the trauma of, of war, but really mixing that in with, with a message of hopefulness, really. Well, thank you, Emma. Let's now move from one revolutionary to another. Mm -hmm. Now, Banksy and de Buffet, not natural bedfellows, but in some ways, they were both using crude techniques to try to make their point. And while that painting came from a crucial early period in de Buffet's career, this came from a crucial early period in Banksy's career. Can you tell me a little bit about the origins of this work? Sure. This painting was made on the occasion of Banksy's 2006 exhibition in LA called Barely Legal. It completely chimes with the title of that show um, and also what that show brought up in terms of its questioning of power structures and asymmetric power structures. Taking place in LA, you've got sort of the height of celebrity, the movie industry, the A-list movie stars, but then you also have a lot of homelessness, a lot of poverty, mm. a lot of crime. So was this the moment when Banksy really broke the United States for the first time? Totally. This is when he really broke through on a global level. His Standout show, even now, this is considered his most important exhibition, barely legal, um, and this painting really is the symbol for that exhibition. Now, this painting was based on a very famous and indeed slightly controversial photograph by Annie Leibovitz. Can you tell me a little bit more about that photo? Sure. I mean, everybody knows 
that photograph. It was really iconic. Um, when it came out in 1991 on the front cover of Vanity Fair, this image of Demi Moore, heavily pregnant, sort of covering herself demurely, but it was seen as pretty much obscene at the time, mm -hmm. even in 1991, which is crazy. Um, just images of female, pregnant female embodiment weren't that sort of common even then, so it was sort of treated like a top shelf porno mag by news agents. It was really hidden away. And I think what Banksy's doing there is just really reflecting on that moment, reflecting mm. on that controversy, and adding his own sort of little poke there at the establishment. Well, let's look at those pokes. First of all, he takes Demi Moore's face, he places a monkey uh, face on top of her, the monkey is smoking a cigarette. Why was he doing that, and, and what do you think he was trying to say? So the monkey is totally synonymous with him mm. and his identity. Famously, he's anonymous. He can't reveal his own identity because of the illegal nature of his street work. So he uses this monkey mask as almost a cipher for his own representation, his own likeness. And you see it in photographs from the mid-2000s onwards, where as his fame grows, he's really using it for photo shoots in pub publicity shots, especially mm -hmm. for his documentary Exit Through the Gift Shop, which, which was a few years later than this. And it's really completely identifiable with Banksy himself. So I like to look at this, look at this painting really as Banksy in drag. It's sort of, <laughs> it's, it's a funny self-portrait in a way. It's how I like to see it. Thank you, Emma. Well, let's turn to another female new, this time by the British sculptor, Frank Dobson. I'm joined by Francis Christie. It's quite nice to see these two works together, isn't it? Because there's a lot of similarity there. Even the pose is very similar. I think what's amazing, actually, is that they were probably about 100 years apart in terms of creation date, because the Dobson was carved around 1926. Mm. But seeing her in front of the Banksy, I think it just reiterates actually quite what an amazing piece of carving this was for 1926. Now, I've seen very few Dobsons like this come onto the market. Is there a reason for that? Dobson carvings are incredibly rare. Mm. Um, he ceased to carve in the early 30s because he hurt his shoulder. Right. And then he just couldn't carve properly after that. And so the objects that he created in the sort of the teens in the 1920s form a very small but highly important body of work. And most of them are in public collections. It really is, as we walk around it, it really is exquisite from every single angle, isn't it? I think there are several things at play here. Um, on the first, he clearly understood the human body, mm -hmm. the female figure rather, the female body, and how to look at her and um, recreate her from every side. And what I think is also amazing about it is his complete knowledge and understanding of the material. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if she's got um, what you see in a Titian, that sort of beautiful kind of slightly blurry outline. Mm. I think the stone here gives it a very warm contour mm. to her body. I, I particularly love the arms. I think they're some of the best carving I've ever seen. And what these arms do is they, they literally sort of pull you around the sculpture, mm. don't they? They drag you around. They there's a lovely twist to that piece. I think it's interesting you mentioned the arms because the way that he's reduced the detail of her mm. fingers just to a very fine line, to me that really shows um, the influence of someone like Picasso. Yes. Um, I mean, Dobson first went to France, to Paris in the early 20s and sort of immersed himself in everything that was going on there. And the way that he's sort of brought her body out, her curves in this very sort of minimal outline, mm. speaks to me of the influence of you know, Picasso's yeah. Classicised nudes from the twenties. It, it's a traditional work. It sort of draws on the, the history of the, the female nude, but it's very modern as well, in a, in a subtle way. No, absolutely. I think for its time, it was at the very forefront of what British artists were doing. Well, it's such a treat to spend time with her. Thank you very much, Francis. One of the most important developments in modern art, as important as perspective was to the Italian Renaissance, was the emergence of abstraction. And together with Helena Newman, I'm going to look at three paintings that each engage with abstraction in different ways. Helena, let's begin with this Kandinsky. Kandinsky was one of the early pioneers of abstraction, but those early abstractions were much more gestural and expressive and organic. This is a very different visual vocabulary here, isn't it? Well, exactly. I mean, by the time he gets to 1927, which is the year of this painting, he's already teaching at the Bauhaus with artists like Clay. So his early kind of pre-First World War moves into abstraction with those organic forms has uh, developed into what is almost entirely geometrical mm. forms. Geometrical forms combined with colour. 
And Kandinsky was obsessed with colour and yes. how the rhythm of combinations of complementary colours, and in here also with this monochrome element, um, creates a kind of visual harmony. Mm. And that's amazingly epitomised in this composition. Where you've got this kind of sense of movement in and out and this dynamic form. Yes, he, he described it, didn't he, to almost being trapped in a, in a harmonium or an accordion. Exactly. The painting does go back and forth, doesn't incredible. it? No, it's an incredible effect. I mean, it's, it's, it's reduced down, but the energy and the dynamic is absolutely in line with the compositions of the teams, but now abstracted fully. Well, let's turn to another abstraction, but a very different abstraction by the French artist Yves Tanguy. What is going on here? This is a very, very different visual vocabulary to what we are seeing with Kandinsky. Well, this is a masterpiece of Yves Tanguy's surrealism. I mean, an absolutely fantastic example, completely exquisite. And, and Tanguy developed his own visual language, mm. and the forms, these kind of uh, biomorphic forms, um, draw on all sorts of aspects of his own uh, biography, uh, the sort of Breton um, uh, seascapes and mm. sand and water, and then the sort of North African landscapes. So, I mean, it, this is very much his visual uh, language uh, with this incredible gradation of colour and almost ab abstract forms, which is a quintessential surrealist mm. work. And in that sense, heralds the journey towards abstraction. He was a master of the landscape without a horizon, wasn't he? Absolutely, yes. It's almost Fantastic. like a horizon on, on planet Jupiter, it's, you know, a landscape where it's, it's just a kind of gaseous yeah, cloud. Yeah, it's magnificent because that gradation is just exquisite. And it's, how how important was is nostalgia and memory to this work and to Tongi's work in general? Well, I think, he, you know, he's built up over many years this sort of language which combines these... Um, kind of motifs that he associates with uh, landscapes of his childhood and his and his life. So it, it's kind of it's a it's a personal vocabulary and um, incredibly evocative. Well, while we're on the subject of landscapes of childhood, yeah. we must go to the Gorky over here because this is explicitly about that, isn't it? Yes. Well, this is a fantastic painting about Ashil Gorky. I mean, it's, it's a masterpiece. Mm. It's incredibly rare for us to handle a painting by Gorky. Really? I and mean, they virtually, I mean, it's so rare. Um, most of the major works in museums, this comes from an important series known as The Garden at Sochi. Mm. Um, a closely related work is in MoMA. Mm. Um, they're, they're very, very um, hard to come by, and this comes from a, a, a private collection where it's been for many, many years. And he's looking back um, at, uh, well, I mean, it's kind of play on words, really, because he, he didn't come from Sochi, he actually mm. came from Armenia. Mm. But, I mean, we think that the, the, the symbolism of this is drawing on the garden of his childhood, and particularly um, a, a garden that had very strong symbolic meaning for the mm. community there, and so the, the sort of uh, the symbolism of trees and nature. But in the end, that's just the start of what is essentially a composition that is, you know, totally moving towards an abstract and expressionist mm. art. Um, and you know, if you sit this with, uh, you know, de Kooning, or you think of what Miro was doing already, um, it's absolutely a masterpiece of American art of the mid 20th century. So it's actually very exciting to see these all together because you can see that journey from Europe to America. And, and Gorky, who, who was an American artist but born in Armenia, is in a way an epitome of that. And he, mm. and he knew the work of Miro, um, he knew Tongi. Um, and it all sort of comes together in this sort of moment at the early 40s. Thank you very much. Well, now let's head over to Paris once again and to Thomas Bompard. In the modern section of our Paris cell, we are immensely proud to have two striking paintings by Francis Picavia. The first example is this monumental transparency created by Picabia in the early 30s. He reproduced a sculpture located in the Museum Archeologico in Naples. And all around and all over, he has painted several layers uh, of imagery in order to create a new organical one, mixing uh, biblical or antique art with a modern technique. Picabia was fascinated by Adam et Eve, and the creator of Adam et Eve is God. So there is some kind of a playful 
um, and very humoristic um, conversation uh, between Picabia and God himself. You can see that he chose to superimpose all over the, the, the couple a face that looks like more Gertrude Stein than Mona Lisa, and the, 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 the bigger than life energy of this composition is particularly striking. So let me introduce you to the Matador dans la Reine. Among the late paintings created by Picabia, this is undoubtedly one of the most exhibited, published, illustrated work of this late period. In all sense, this is such a brilliant technique. But what am I looking at? I'm not even sure it is a painting, much more like a movie or an opera, because there are so many different things happening here. I admire the composition and the, the virtuosity with which Picabia comes from one thing to its opposite. For example, you have the, the fixity and the, the statuesque uh, position of this character, this one of course, this here, balanced with the dynamism of the whole composition. Um, of course, you have the circularity of the arena, reinforced by those rounded um, shadows that creates a very theatrical stage for the, the, the art of, uh, of Picabia. Is it a self-portrait? I don't know. Picabia has decided to keep hidden the face of the most uh, obvious character. This painting was in the same private collection since the early 1970s. So it is a real honor for us to offer such a masterpiece, uh, not only to the Picabia uh, many admirers, but I would say to any uh, any collector, any art lover. One of the great things about a cross-category sale is you can travel all over the world. And this next work by Bachman Mohassas takes us to post-war Iran. I'm joined by Ashkan Baghastani. Now most people, Ashkan, probably wouldn't have heard of Bachman Mohassas, and yet he's known as the Picasso of Iran. Can you introduce us to him? Yes, of course, James. Uh, Bahman Moasses was born in Iran in 1931. He is celebrated and considered one of the most radical avant-garde and um, ahead of his time artists uh, from that generation of modernists in Iran. Um, in 1953, he left Iran to Italy after the coup uh, of Mossadegh. He there discovered the rich heritage of Europe from Greek and Roman mythology to the uh, avant-gardes of the post-war era. And um, he, he went uh, back and forth between Iran and Italy. And obviously, 1970 comes. Iran is buoyant in terms of culture mm -hmm. and, and its uh, festivals and, and its museum building, the Timoka in that case. The Empress was very fond of him. She commissioned a lot of public works. Uh, he was part of an art uh, community that respected him, even though his style was very different from what was done at the time in Iran. And then the revolution happened in 1979. A lot of his works were destroyed, and therefore he left. He exiled himself into Italy, um, recluse for a few years until he started painting again and exhibiting again in Italy. And this is probably the best example of the 70s by Bahman Moasis um, because of its scale and, and importance. Is it unusually large for him? It is unusually large. We've sold mostly small works by the artist. He doesn't paint in this scale. This is about 200 centimeters. Uh, so it is considered monumental for the artist. There is uh, the idea that he didn't, couldn't necessarily afford large canvases, couldn't necessarily uh, keep them uh, in, his, uh, in his flat. So therefore, he's always painted in small format. So when we discovered this painting, we were, we were quite impressed by its scale. Um, it's and one, intensity. It's one of those paintings, you say intensity, it's one of those paintings that even from a hundred meters it, it takes you by the jug, doesn't you, it? Yes, definitely. It really grabs you. It, it, it captures the attention. And it's funny, a lot of his minotaurs that I've seen in the past from the 60s and earlier period, they actually look at uh, the, um, the seascape, they don't look at the viewer. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the rare ones that is actually looking at the viewer with an intense gaze. Well, it's also got that blood red paint that's yes. used in the mouth and in the eyes that yes. gives it this ferocious intensity. Exactly, and, and talking a bit more actually about the painting, um, this subject of the Minotaur was Moasis' most celebrated subject. 
iconic, I would say. His highest prices are for Minotaurs. Usually we've sold Minotaurs from the 60s, rarely from the 70s, actually never from the 70s. And, and here you have a, a sort of seated Minotaur, very masculine, extremely, uh, extremely strong. He's dangerously um, powerful, but also strangely impotent. He's feetless, he's sitting on the beach, he's quite static, he can't move. And then, like you said before, he has these uh, bloody eyes, like he's hungry for blood or for human flesh. And, and I don't want to draw direct comparison to Moasis' life and character, but he was a strange um, um, character, um, figure. And, uh, but I think it's really rooted in his fascination for Greek and Roman mythology, and, and, um, and he takes a lot from that. So he's painted these mythological subjects throughout his whole life, especially the Minotaur. He's named the Picasso of Iran. It's not necessarily for his style, but more about what the Minotaur represents for him. Picasso, um, you know, his alter ego was the Minotaur, yeah. sort of powerful, uh, masculine, uh, potent man. And, and I think for uh, Moasis it was something quite different, something a bit more uh, rooted in exist existentialism and, um, and the human condition. The, the Minotaur subject um, in Greek mythology is quite, uh, you know, a perverse, um, uh, the perversity of the human nature. Mm. And Moasis was very uh, affected by the many wars throughout the 60s, 70s, by the revolution, and by what was going on in the Middle East back then. Um, so well, it's a, it's a stunning painting. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Thank you. Well, from a painting inspired by a huge beast to a sculpture inspired by a small one, this is Alexander Calder's Moths. And I'm joined by Ollie Barker, chairman of Sotheby's Europe and auctioneer of the Modern Renaissance sale on the 25th of March. Ollie, what can you tell me about this beautiful work? Well, James, th this is the first of three iterations of the moth sculptures, this one being moths number one, and obviously followed up by moths two and three. Number two, in fact, being in the collection of the San Francisco Museum of Art. And, th and this is really a critical period for Alexander Calder. Made in 1947, in fact, exhibited in December 1947 at the Buchholz Gallery in New York in an exhibition that was actually joined by a catalogue uh, written by Jean-Paul Sartre, no less, as well. And um, interestingly, this particular work in that show was joined by about 28 or so sculptures, was later exhibited in 1964 at the Artist Retrospective at the Guggenheim, and then was first acquired in 1951 from the Kurt Valentin Gallery uh, by Paul Lester Wiener, who was a really interesting architect, polymath, uh, lived in New York, and actually was the man responsible in 1958 for the architectural design and implementation of uh, New York's Washington Square Park as well. Uh, and he, with his wife, Ingeborg, who was an artist, were great collectors, great intellectuals at the time, uh, and probably met Calder through Le Corbusier. <laughs> so you've got this rather wonderful sort of uh, link between the artistic worlds of New York, the architectural worlds of the New York, all conflicting together, but really the avant-garde, and looking at artists like Alexander Calder in his prime with something really phenomenal like the Mott Swan sculpture here. Well, I've got to say, after a long, hard London lockdown, this work, and indeed all the works in the, in the sale, remind me how wonderful it is to be surrounded by great works of art. Well, I think viewers have had more than enough of me, so I'm going to pass over to Ollie for some concluding remarks. Thank you, James, for having taken us so wonderfully through over 500 years of art history that are represented in the sales that are taking place next week. And of course, the first of them will be the Art Impressionniste Moderne, taking place from our Paris sales room and beginning at 4 p.m. Central European time on the 25th of March. And then hastily followed up after that, starting at 5 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time in London with the Modern Renaissance sale as well. And we very much hope you will, you will watch the action on Sotheby's.com. But in the meantime, please feel free to look at the catalogues that are on our website. There's some wonderful material available with videos and all sorts of insightful essays and images of the paintings and works of art that we'll be selling next week as well. And indeed, please feel free to reach out to our experts should you have any questions about any of the works that we'll be selling next week in either London or in Paris, of course, as well. And then finally, we look forward to welcoming you to the live stream sales as well. They'll be live from Sotheby's.com, as I mentioned, starting in Paris. And uh, please tune in to watch the action. Thank you so much.